What I'm about to share with you is not to be attempted by anyone without a great deal of knowledge and experience in the art of witchcraft and conjuration. This is an advanced technique I'm sharing for academic purposes and is not to be taken lightly. That said, I'm not a knowledge gatekeeper and you are to blame for your own actions. Therefore, I'm not responsible for how you use this information I'm about to give you, but you'd be wise to listen to my warning. Additionally, this video contains graphic ritual details and some dark ideas many people will find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Let us begin. Hi, welcome to Cypher Grove, the channel where we dive deep into the profound esoteric mysteries of spirituality, religion, metaphysics, and the occult. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. That said, please enjoy the video. I'm very well known among my local pagan and spiritualist community. People in this little hidden subculture know me as having a lot of experience dealing with spirits. My main skill is spirit summoning. I'm a conjurer, a demonolater. It's my specialty. I've had quite a few people who know this about me ask me to remove spirits or presences from their homes. Sometimes a spirit, human or non-human, embeds itself in a place that humans reside in and the two become incompatible. It can create a toxic environment, a cloud of negative psychic smog. But I'm not an exorcist. And while I do banish unwanted spirits and energies often and when needed, I also don't like uprooting spirits from their homes by force if I can help it. Sometimes it's inevitable, but I devised a method that I think is a more suitable alternative. Several years ago, I began studying sex magic, and its very strange world of sensual secrets. I stumbled upon an ancient practice from the Near East called sacred prostitution, or sometimes hieros gamos, which means holy marriage. In some Mesopotamian cultures, particularly in the worship of the goddess Inanna or Ishtar, a high priestess would act as a representative of the goddess and would engage in sexual union with a king or a high priest, symbolizing the marriage between the deity and the ruler to ensure fertility and prosperity. It was also present in certain Greek cultures, in the cults of Aphrodite, where the goddess would be called down to inhabit the body of a mortal woman as she engaged in sexual acts. And so, when the king or priest or so on would have sex with her, it would be as though he would be having sex with the goddess herself. Drawing the power of a god into your body and then acting as a literal representative or stand-in of that god was something I found quite interesting. I had an idea. What if I removed the sexual aspect and applied this to other areas of magic? Now, before I say what I did next, allow me to state I have an extensive amount of knowledge and experience with spirit contact and conjuration. I've summoned incredibly powerful spirits and worked with them, and had a very wide array of situations and scenarios I've dealt with and learned from, so I know what I'm doing. Don't try this if you don't. Part of my regular practice involves giving offerings to the spirits I often work with and benefit from particularly to deities and demons. Now, I always thought it was quite odd to give things like food and drinks to spiritual entities who lacked physical bodies to truly enjoy them. So, when I would offer up my thanks to these deities, I would invoke them into my body and give them permission to experience my offerings through my physical senses. So, I would consume for them. I would inhale and breathe for them. I would be their eyes, their mouth, their ears, their hands. I had immense success with this, and the tangible results of my rituals were insanely strong. But then it occurred to me, what if the role was reversed? What if, instead of allowing the spirit to inhabit me and eat its offering, I instead brought the spirit down into the food and ate it? I would literally be eating the spirit itself. And then I realized something. I was describing Holy Communion. That's what communion is, is it not? A priest or a pastor stands over bread and wine or grape juice and proclaims that they are the literal flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. 
and then the congregation eats them and drinks them as a symbol of themselves becoming like Christ. So I began thinking about this and experimenting with it. And eventually I was once again asked to investigate a haunting case. I took with me an apple alongside my usual supplies. And so I entered that space and began the process of conjuring that spirit up. And I don't like to compel spirits through force to appear to me. Instead, I like to coax them forth with things that they like. If it's a non-human entity, I will prepare the space with various things that that entity is associated with. For example, if I was conjuring Aphrodite, I would light a very sweet-smelling incense and place flowers, seashells, and water in the area. For a human spirit, I like to use things that that person had an affinity for while they were alive. Perhaps clothing that they wore or certain possessions they had. If I have access to their cologne or perfume, I'll spray that in the air. Essentially, you're making way for the spirit by preparing the space for them. Of course, it's not entirely this simple. There's various cleansing, incantations, chants, and paraphernalia you have to use as well. But this is ultimately the basic process. Then I did the actual conjuration, the call, so to speak, which is the formal invitation for that spirit to enter the area. Now, some spirits require more prerequisite work, such as performing trance-induced gazes at their sigil or name, visualizing various symbols or archetypes, and so on. But at this point, you basically work on enabling the spirit to enter the area. Sometimes you'll get dramatic results, objects moving or even certain visuals and sounds, voices speaking to you. Or sometimes you'll just get a slight chill down your spine, or the ever so slight feeling that something is in the room with you. When the spirit arrives and I can confirm its presence one way or another, I officially greet it and state my intent. I then begin a free and open dialogue with the spirit, asking it to communicate with me. And in this instance, it did. That specific spirit was being held in place by several larger, more powerful spirits that were inhabiting the area, and so I offered it an escape. Tell me your name, I said, and I will have the power to take you away from this place. You need only live peaceably with me, and I will treat you well. The spirit agreed and told me his name. I then created a sigil for the spirit using the name it gave me, and I carved this sigil into the apple I'd brought. I like using apples in magic. They are, in my opinion, the best magical conduits. When you cut them in half, you'll find five seeds arranged like a pentagram. And so apples contain the best matrix for natural spiritual energy. But you can just as easily use another fruit or bread or any other food that can be practical for this method. After anointing the apple and richly bathing the carving in my blood, I invited the spirit to inhabit it and then bound the spirit there. Then I raised the apple to my lips and ate. I carried the spirit with me from that place, and it's been a loyal friend ever since. I repeated this process again and again, collecting willing spirits wherever I went. Now, I never collected an unwilling spirit, or one that refused me. I don't believe in forcing spirits to do anything against their will. But I was surprised just how many were eager to join me. I've been refused only a handful of times. I do give them a condition, however. They must pledge their friendship and loyalty to me. I'm not much of an authoritarian, but this seemed like a safeguard but it didn't seem to deter any spirits or take away their eagerness. I promised the spirits to treat them well, to invite them into my life and give them regular gratification and offerings. In fact, I regularly hold what I call spirit feasts, where I give them mass offerings. They've become loyal friends that have helped me in my waking life. Of course, after a while, a bit of chaos ensued, it's rather taxing to absorb so many spirits into you, and some of them can clash at times. The chaotic energies of all these souls clashing against each other inside you can also be incredibly overwhelming, and it can really upend your life if you aren't careful. So I enlisted in some help. I began creating servitors, artificial spirits splintered from my own manifested psyche, 
Through meditation, hypnosis, and other ritual acts, I was able to project these servitors into existence. They basically acted like hall monitors, maintaining my inner house of souls. They made sure each spirit acted according to our agreements and did not step out of line. Of course, I'd need more help than this. I enlisted in the help of several big-name deities like Hecate and the demon Andras, who is a demon I seek for many matters of protection, and the two of them bestowed me with familiars that also acted as guardians and keepers of my inner kingdom. Still, sometimes I need to let a spirit out and give it a physical home, such as a vessel or an object or some kind of effigy or doll. It's just more practical that way. But I am a walking legion. This is why when other witches have attacked me in my sleep, their spells have fallen short. I've woken up in the middle of the night to the sight of spirits fighting in my own bedroom, realizing that my defenders are protecting me from something malicious that's been sent my way. I am guarded by layers and layers of proud spiritual allies. It will be very hard to peel them all away. Within me lies a host of spirits. Some human, some not human, but all of them having entered into alliance with me and having their own home and residence within my life. Using meditation and astral travel, I'm able to visit them more directly and have constructed various astral residences for them to stay in. Think of it like a military base, but hopefully a little more luxurious. This is a practice that is very unorthodox, even by the standards of most other witches. Most witches are rather afraid of letting spirits inhabit their space, let alone their body. And before anything superstitious is speculated on the matter, no, they do not possess me. They do not have permission, nor the ability, to override my personal willpower or individuality. This of course is further safeguarded by my guardians and familiars. But despite the strangeness of this practice, it's benefited my life in many ways. I am never alone. I always feel like someone has my back, like someone is watching out for me. And it's very comforting. I develop deep relationships with these spirits, and I know them all by name. Some of them have come to me to escape environments of abuse and psychic negativity and I've helped them work through some of their issues and soul trauma. Some of them I've helped pass onto the other side. Of course it does benefit me, but in another way, it is an act of personal charity. I believe in reincarnation, especially when we die and our souls are still vibrating on the traumatic energy levels of this earthly plane, therefore rerouting them back to be reborn on Earth. If I'm able to reach them before that time and help them work through their issues, I can help them avoid this and move on to the next plane. It's a labor of love, and I enjoy it. So if you ever reach a level of magical expertise and proficiency in conjuration, where this becomes possible and safe for you, I recommend giving it a go. You might find yourself to be a counselor of the spirits. Thank you for watching. My name is Dorian, and this is Cypher Grove.